Hey, welcome to House of History. Nowadays, people, at least in the Western world, tend to marry when they are in love and do so on an unpressured basis. Throughout history, it hasn't always been like that, obviously. And although marriage was seen as a tool to increase or preserve wealth and power, it was often brought to extremes by powerful dynasties. One of the most powerful and influential families of European history was the House of Habsburg. As a matter of fact, that house is the embodiment of what can happen if you properly play your marriage politics. The house's power's expansion started with the Swiss count, only to end up ruling over seven countries as monarchs. This was achieved by practicing cunning and practical marriage politics, and always marrying up the power ladder, so to speak. But this is also where we get to the issue of the whole situation. Perhaps some of you have already thought of this, but within a few generations of upward mobility marriage, well, who are you going to marry? If your family is the embodiment of power in Europe and no other family can even compete, then any marriage with other royal families will only net you losing control. And if, for example, your children marry into another family, why would the other family not practice the same marriage politics that you practice to get to the top and erode your power pace? And, well, yeah, you guessed it, the Habsburgs did what other royal families had figured out as well. They decided to marry each other to maintain their power base. And for multiple generations, Habsburg married their first or second cousins. Thing is, nature has a system to prevent this type of inbreeding. And within several generations, the Habsburgs started to experience the effects of marrying within their bloodline. Inbreeding tends to have some very disturbing genetic effects on offspring, and multiple generations of Habsburgs already suffered from this. But the man that really got the worst end of the stick was more or less the embodiment of the effects, and that was Charles II, King of Spain. Now, as for Habsburg's influence in Spain, due to a fortunate chain of events since the early 16th century, the Swiss Habsburgs provided its king. And the Spanish Habsburg line was notorious for their inbreeding. They frequently married close relatives such as uncle niece, first cousins, and if you look close at their family tree, you will see that it often loops back into itself. Charles' father, Philip IV, and his mother, Mariana, were uncle and niece, and their grandparents, Charles' great-grandparents, were all descendants of the same two people, Joanna and Philip of Castile. So, well, it's quite the understatement to say Charles had some inferior genes. This section of a biography sums it up quite well. The Habsburg King Carlos II of Spain was sadly degenerated with an enormous misshapen head. His Habsburg jaw stood so much out that his two rows of teeth could not meet. He was unable to chew. His tongue was so large that he was barely able to speak. His intellect was similarly disabled. His brief life consisted chiefly of a passage from prolonged infancy to premature senility. Carlos' family was anxious only to prolong his days and thought little about his education so that he could barely read or write. He had been fed by wet nurses until the age of five or six and was not allowed to walk until almost fully grown. Even then he was unable to walk properly because his legs would not support him and he fell several times. His body remained that of an invalid child. The nature of his upbringing, the inadequacy of his education, the stiff etiquette of his court, his dependence upon his mother, and his superstition helped to create a mentally retarded and hypersensitive monarch. It's an incredible sad description, but the paintings of Charles really do show a man that isn't entirely 100%. He had the traditional Habsburg features, such as the long jaw, flattened face, and turned down nose, but all these features were brought to extreme in his being. When Charles was four years old, his father passed away and he became king. Obviously, he couldn't rule himself, certainly not at that age, so his mother became his regent. Due to his weak mind, his tutors thought it irresponsible to educate him, so the boy wasn't properly educated at all. It was terrible to the degree that he wasn't even taught to keep himself clean, and he became notorious for his lack of hygiene. Contemporary descriptions state that his stench was unbearable and his hair was unwashed. He walked around in a state of permanent filth, and as he grew older, his underbite got worse, and he couldn't even chew any food, not to mention the drooling. As Charles turned 14, he could now legally rule the kingdom by himself, but obviously he was in no capacity to do so. His mother, the Queen Regent, continued her regency, something that didn't sit well with the only son out of wedlock Charles' father had recognized, John of Austria the Younger. With ever-increasing tensions at court and rising debt of the Habsburg crown, John launched a palace coup against the Queen Regent in 1677. He now took control of the country, but setting things straight proved much more complicated than had probably been expected. To begin with, 
Spain had many overseas colonies, but the gold and silver flowing in from the New World led to reckless spending and this rapid inflation, rendering Spanish currency devalued. Furthermore, the domestic political infrastructure was chaotic. Spain was nothing more than a patchwork of barons and counts, a bit like the Holy Roman Empire. Now, perhaps John could have made progress in this department. Was it not for him dying two years after taking power? Charles wasn't up to the task to rule, so a marriage was arranged for him. He married the French Marie-Louise d'Orléans. Uh, the girl was appalled at the thought of marrying him, and it is said she spent most of the time weeping. A very long and sad story short, the marriage remained childless, and due to strict Spanish court customs and the mental infirmity of Charles, Marie remained a very lonely and depressed woman. That is not to say Charles didn't love her, because he certainly did, and throughout the entire marriage he would. Ten years after the wedding in 1689, the depressed Marie fell off a horse and passed away. Charles and Marie's marriage remained childless, however, so another wedding was arranged. After all, a successor to the throne was necessary. Charles now married the pro-Austrian Maria Anna of Neuburg. Still, this marriage too remained childless, with many concluding that Charles must be infertile. The last decades of Charles' life were subject to constant war with France over Spanish possessions in the Netherlands and court intrigues between pro-Austrian and pro-French factions. And over the years, Charles' health deteriorated. Contemporaries had expected Charles to die very young, but to many surprise, he managed to survive his 20s. Yet by 35, it was apparent his already minimal physical and mental capabilities were deteriorating. The last years of his life were marked by acts of madness. He died at the age of 39, and following his death, a doctor performed an autopsy on him, and he found the following. The king's body did not contain a single drop of blood. His heart was the size of a peppercorn. His lungs corroded, his intestines rotten and gangrenous. He had a single testicle, black as coal, and his head was full of water. It is the incredible sad story of Charles II, the unfortunate product of the Habsburg mission to try and keep power within the family. Ironically, because of Charles' disabilities following his death, the war of the Spanish succession broke out. Charles had named Philip, the grandson of the French king, as his successor. This would establish a massive power base for the French in southwestern Europe, leading to the Netherlands, England and the Holy Roman Empire to wage war against Bourbon Spain and France. In essence, Charles' death led to the decline and removal of Habsburg's ruling over Spain. Oh, and as for Charles' second wife, Maria Anna, she was exiled to Toledo after his death. She was deported to France in 1706 and lived there until 1739. She died one year later after returning and living quietly in Spain. Basically, the life story of Charles is a somber one, and only has losing sights for those directly involved, not to mention the shocking anatomy of the man. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider becoming a patron or a channel member. For just $1 a month, you will already gain access to the exclusive patron series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.